I would have seen Ralph. What's up, everybody? Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Monday Night Must See TV with the Hudson Valley Square. It's Monday night. Thanks for tuning in. We got uh, got part of the crew tonight and a very special guest from the Monsters Den and the Curse of the Collectors. You've seen him here on every other show on the channel. Mr. Jamie Laszlo. What's going on, Jamie? What's going on? It kind of looks like the Monsters Den. Four out of six. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And uh, also here. We're going to do this. I, we, okay. we didn't do that right yeah exactly we don't we don't do that on monday nights chris that's that's an interesting <laughs> thing so uh chris al is in the house craig kaminsky's in the house ryan scow's in the house and count ralphus himself ralph tenmore is in the house what's up gentlemen what's going on what's going on fellas we're just talking about how difficult this assignment was and uh it kind of was and then once you started really thinking about it it got a little easier but basically the concept is Albums that most people don't really like much, whether it be friends, fellow fans, critics, right? Uh, but we kind of dig. You know, maybe we don't love them, but we kind of like these albums, or maybe we do love them, right? So uh, I asked everybody to pick out at least three. I think most of us have come up with a few more or whatever. So we'll go through whatever we have, and uh, we'll let our guests today go first. So, Jamie, why don't you, uh, what's your first pick? Just do one? Yeah, just do one. All right. First of all, I had all of 30 minutes to prepare. <laughs> 30 minutes. <laughs> all right. Watching a movie. All right. So you uh, got to tell us, what were you watching when I interrupted you? What were you watching? The Tombs of the Blind uh, Dead. 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 Oh. Yeah. I was like, is it zombie? <laughs> I don't think it's zombie. It's dead. Yeah. Tombs of the Blind Dead. Great got a half it. hour left. I'm enjoying it. First time I've seen it. Really? Uh, great. Yeah. Great. I'm in my Favorite? pajamas. And I get the text, you want to be uh, on Hudson Valley Squares? This is the topic. Well, fuck. <laughs> I got to get up. I can't, I'm i skimming through these albums. Do I like this? Do I like this? Do I? 30 seconds of each song. So let me just go into it. I got, uh, I got five. Should I do five or should I do three? Whatever. Because they're in the order of so, yeah, how sucky people <laughs> think they are. So yeah. I'm going to start with five. This look, no, I don't think anybody thinks Opeth ever did a bad album, right? Mm -hmm. Opeth fans, uh, but I think this normally comes at the bottom. Heritage, you know, it's, it's the closest to a sucky album they've done. But I gotta tell you what, it's been growing on me, man, for years and years and for a decade. And I think, I think 25% of the time I grab Opeth for the last year or so, I grab this album. Which is weird, because what, they got like 10 albums? And you do the math, 25% of the time I'm grabbing this one. And here's the strange thing about this album that I just found out while I was running around preparing. People say it's disjointed, not very cohesive. Well, I'm listening to the songs, and the first thing I thought when I was skimming through them is, these sound better as a whole. So if it's disjointed, which I always kind of agree with, why do these songs sound better as a whole to me? How is it both? It's like witchcraft on this album, how that works. So I'm going with Opeth, Heritage, number one. And look, Folklore, one of my top five Opeth songs for me. And Heritage and the Devil's Orchid, you, you can't go wrong with that. And, and uh, it gets a little slow in the middle, but that's when it works, I think, with the album and not single cuts. So yeah. Love heritage. I think it depends on who you talk to. I think the old school Opeth fans who only like the death metal material hate that album. But I think like most folks who either have moved on and have accepted the new stuff or those people right. who only listen to the new stuff because they don't like growling vocals love that album. So yeah, it depends on who you talk to. But yeah, I remember when that first came out, people were like, what the hell is this? Right? I love it. I right. think it's a great album again. That's a good choice. Chris. Um, all right, my uh, my first pick uh, is a record that I own four copies of, and I am pissed at myself. I couldn't find one of them. Uh, <laughs> I got like seven or eight uh, other discs, uh, but this one I have on vinyl, uh, a cassette, and two CDs. Uh, came out in late 1987, and pretty much the entire heavy metal world hated it, um, but I have always liked it. And it's Venom's Calm Before the Storm. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, the band certainly suffers uh, from the loss of, uh, of Mantis, uh, you know, but most people shit all over the record. 
you know, because it's got a much uh, cleaner sound to it. And they, the band completely uh, disassociated themselves from any of the uh, satanic references in the lyrics and imagery that they did on the, the first four records. But uh, I dug it then and I dug it now. Uh, so yeah, that's my, uh, I can't hold it up. And I'm like, I know I have fucking two CDs of this. Uh, I don't know where the hell the tape and the record were, but I don't know. Yeah, but that's you gotta fun. be the only person I know that has four copies of that album. Dude, I really <laughs> like it. I, I mean, I know it's different, but I, I really like it. It's funny. We were just joking on, on, uh, in you the prog that. seat. Chuck Alvarez is joking how he can never find this stuff and it's lost in this closet that he has in his in his apartment. I'm thinking one of these days we need to get into Aloe's garage and Chuck's closet <laughs> and find out where all this stuff is, you know? I just found a box of stuff I had pulled for another episode. I go, fucking Pete, because it never made it back out to the garage. So oh, I, if you don't I, stay I, on top of it, it, it'll, it gets away from you. Oh, that's yeah. True. I, that's I gotta, a, that's a, yeah. See, Jamie, you just remodeled that whole basement of yours. Now you're on top of everything now, right? You got, you know where everything yep. is, right? Yep. Yep. Very important. I can pull it out like this. There you go. Very important. Craig. Okay, thanks. Uh, you may not know it from the looks of me, but when the, uh, the mood strikes and the alcohol is just at the right level, I can, uh, I got some moves on the dance floor. So uh, when this, this group here, most people... I, you know, at least I, this is one of those albums that sold like, you know, 5 million copies or whatever, but yet most of the people for, uh, that are fans of the band, you know, don't like it, but I happen to like ZZ Top's Afterburner. And, uh, I love really, that during the I, summer, dude, love and it. I, and, uh, you know, sleeping bag, Velcro fly, the, the two dusty songs are heavy, you know, on this can't stop rocking and delirious, uh, Woke up with wood. I got the message. I I really enjoy uh, this album. Yeah, it's a lot of synthy, synthy uh, type tracks to it. And the drums kind of sound fake for you know for for 1985 and uh, you know and everything. But you know what? When you're when you're driving, whether it's a warm day or not, the song I, I think the songs just are are really fun. It's and a fun they album. Do, and they do kind of you know it is kind of like a dancey album. You can't help but tap your foot, move your head, you know, shake your money maker, whatever it is you want to do. But, uh, but I, I quite enjoy uh, ZZ Top's Afterburner. And I know a and lot he, of, a lot of fans, you know, like, Oh my God, that's not, I can't believe that's the same three guys that did Trace Hombres, but it's a lot of fun. And I, I really enjoy it. Here's the beautiful thing about that album. When it gets to the last song, you're kind of tired of it, but it's the last song anyways. So to hell with it. Yeah. I think it's better than Eliminator just me yeah maybe because eliminator is a little worn out and overplayed but yeah that one i don't know it's a fun out it's a fun summer album yeah steal a line from chris <laughs> oof yeah, I don't, one I don't of my know. least favorite cc top albums but I'll, yeah I'll, there are a couple I'll, good I'll songs Craig's yeah. word for it. i will say there are there are a couple good songs though. and you know billy's guitar playing as always is good Oh, it's always good. Man, that synthy stuff and the horrible drums. I'm just like, oh. Well, I, I do. I hate the song Rough Boy, though. But the other nine songs, uh, I, I quite enjoy. All right, cool. Ryan. All right, well, two of the albums on my list, uh, I think part of why they were not loved, or not the only reason, but part of why it was because on the original issues, they had some uh production woes we'll say and they've uh over the years since experienced remasters reissue like pretty much head to toe you know reworks not just like a simple remaster but like a full remix so the first one we're gonna go to norway oh so you know what i didn't want to talk about some less obvious choices so i'm gonna tell you what i'm not gonna talk about first what i do like but i'm not gonna talk about it. i'm not gonna talk about the x factor i'm not gonna talk about that I'm not gonna talk about jugulator and i'm not gonna talk about Slayer, Diabolus, and Musica. I'm just going to put those back over there. I forget I even mentioned that. So, uh, go over to Norway. The first band is one of the most, probably the most famous black metal band from Norway, and that is Mayhem. 1994, Mayhem comes out with De Mysterious Sum Satanis, one of the most popular, beloved black metal albums ever. Uh, of course, you have all the drama, you know, the bass player murders the guitarist, churches are burned, big brouhaha, right? Jail sentences, all kinds of bullshit. So then they kind of I don't want to say fucked off for a while, but they obviously had to reshuffle their lineup. 
and uh, take a couple of years to regroup. And they did. And they came back in, I think, the year 2000 with a very divisive album uh, that I loved, but uh, very few people seem to like. And that was uh, Grand Declaration of War. So they got their original vocalist uh, back from earlier in the 80s. The guy's name was Maniac. You know, it's his good Christian name. Uh, they had a new guitarist, as their old guitarist was <clears throat> no longer among us. And uh, same bass player, same drummer. And it's a very mechanical, futuristic album. Uh, a lot of spoken word parts, but very like this. It's not spoken word like uh, like you're listening to like a Henry Rollins kind of thing. It's like this very arrogant, like uh, like he's preaching to a crowd. I don't know. It's very it's I could totally see why people don't like this. Uh, but a couple of years, a couple of years recently, uh, they reissued it with a totally they totally re gutted the sound did it from the ground up. It's much less mechanical. The drums actually sound like a human instead of a fucking typewriter. Uh, so I, this is the nice version. So this is the one I usually listen to. So in this case, the remaster actually, I didn't have a problem with the original. It's very like the sterile sound kind of fits the music. But uh, I still like my music to sound like black metal to sound like it's played by fucking human beings. And this kind of has the remaster really took care of that. So I'm going with Grand Declaration of War. And... Karen sent me her list, so I will say her first pick is Acid Eaters by the Ramones, which was one of their later albums, which, uh, you know, I like the album, but it's not an album, uh, I guess I just never dug into it too much to know that it was kind of a disliked album among their fan base. Some of their later stuff kind of, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, Rocket to Rush or Leave Home or like the first album, which is like the iconic, like when you think of punk rock, you think of the Ramones, you think of those albums, but I always liked it, so... Yeah, it's all, a, all it's covers. A album. Yeah, they're all covers. All covers. Well, that's right. Yeah, shit. You know what? It's the uh, I actually it's the thirteenth album, so nineteen ninety three. So I'm about to go back to that one actually. But yeah, covers albums are kind of a hard sell. So I guess I can understand that. I can't really think of many off the top of my head that uh, I really ever gave a crap about. But yeah, that's that one of the best favorite. ones. That's one of the best ones, I think. For yeah, covers like a uh, journey to the center of the mind and uh, yeah, a, lot, yeah. a lot of 60s songs you know so that's why it's acid eaters yeah that sounds they like, all a sound like they could be Ram ramones originals in a way you know they almost all sound like they could be originals mm -hmm. i don't have to go back to it i think i actually got a bamboozle in my head with another album which was the album that had pet cemetery on it I think it was like Mondo Bizarre. yeah that's what i think that's what i was thinking of so yeah there we go Aaron and I were just talking yesterday on our Church of Misery album ranking how they do great covers, and I, I would personally love to hear a covers album from them. Most times I hate these covers albums. They're just terrible. But, like, Church of Misery picks out these really obscure, like, proto-metal songs and stuff, like, you know, songs that you wouldn't expect anybody to cover, which I think is cool. So that's The Garage Days do. album by Metallica is pretty good. The, uh, the 98 one, or 99 one. This one's, uh, actually, since I'm sitting next to it, this one's speaking of 60s covers, the originally black metal band, but now they sound like the Pesh Mode. The Norwegian band Oliver did this one called Childhood's End, and it's all covers of like cool 60s songs, uh, just like the Ramones. And they don't sound like they know they do a really nice reimagining of them. So now they sound like you know contemporary Oliver songs when they recovered this or recorded this. But yeah, I always like this one a lot. It's the uh, the covers of Magic Hollow and uh, I had too much to dream last night are fucking awesome. So, yeah, if you're well, something weird, check that out. Cool, the electric prunes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for 10 years, I thought they were saying I had too much to drink last night, like throughout the whole 80s and early 90s. <laughs> All right. And how cool is it that Karen sent her list to her celebrity crush? Ah. I'll tell Keeler that. that the fucking... <laughs> All right, Ralph, what do you got? All right, so this... uh. I'm wearing a shirt for the band Crumb Suckers. Talked about them a few times, but this is the the legendary uh, Life of Dreams album that most people that like this kind of music really love. This album, it's one of the greatest like New York hardcore albums of all time. But they follow it up with this album they called Bomb Beast on My Back. Look at that horrible album cover for That's one. Terrible. You know, you go from this great album cover. I, I think that right off the bat turns people off. And it's happened to me a lot of times where I see a shitty album cover and it, it, it makes you think of the album in a different way. But this album, they go way more metal and it's got a way better production and cleaner sound. 
but it's still really unique sounding and it, they, they actually become more unique because they're not such a, a straightforward hardcore band. And I just remember the scene people just not really liking this album when it came out because it was so different from the, the original that everybody loved. And they end up breaking up after this and then propane starts. But uh, I always, I, I mean, it took a little bit to get into it, but once I did, I kind of go to it more than I go to the original album because I hadn't played it out as bad. So I just, I love it. It's a, a real underrated album and people are still finding it and loving it today. But when it came out, it definitely bombed like the name of the album bombed. Those guys were so underrated as far as their musicianship goes. I think I always thought that they were just terrific, terrific players, whether you like the music or not. Right. But they really could play. Oh, yeah. Dave Mustaine was a fan of them. Uh, Kirk Hammett. There's the famous story of Kirk Hammett getting on stage with them in CBGB's and like the hardcore crowd, like spitting and yelling and shit. And then I guess Billy Milano came out and screamed at the people that were doing that and told them to fuck off and, you know, try to keep it so Metallica didn't get beat up, you know, but. <laughs> cool. All right. My first pick is an album when it first came out, it got pretty much ignored everywhere. And it wasn't until years later uh, when the band actually got really big and the guitar player that's on this first album got pretty big that people would go back to listen to this album. And then they were kind of like, oh, that's really different. That's really old sounding and really German sounding and really kind of kraut rock sounding. But I think it's really good, actually. It's uh, Lonesome Crow by the Scorpions. Oh, nice. A lot of people think this is just like the weird album in their discography. And they're like, oh, it doesn't sound anything like, you know, Rocky Like a Hurricane. It doesn't even sound like the Uli Roth stuff. And that is true. It's kind of bluesy. It's kind of psychedelic. It's definitely kraut rocky. The vocals are a little different. You know, Michael Schenker is, what, like 15 years old here. And I think he plays his ass off here. I like the long tracks. And there's a lot of jamming on here. And, yeah, it sounds totally different. But I think it's really cool that it sounds totally different. So I've, I've always been a big fan of this. Uh, even though some people just can't get into it. But uh, yeah, Lonesome Crow by the Scorpions. That's my first pick. Back to Jamie. All right. Um, I did not know a lot of people disliked this album. Well, dislike is a little harsh until I joined this community. And uh, I found out a lot of people put it low on their ranking. And I think I included it because I think it is by far their best album. I'm going with Thunder 7 by Triumph. A lot of people shit on this album. I'm not sure why. I mean, it is, it's almost perfect. And I'll tell you why it's not perfect. Fucking cool down. There's this Led Zeppelin wannabe Kingdom Come sounding thing. And this was like years before Kingdom Come, like four or five years. But it really brings the album down trying to do that Zeppelin thing. But everything else, I mean, Spellbound, Rock Out, Roll On, Time Goes By, Stranger is Follow Your Heart is fucking fantastic. I think it's just great. And I love the cover. The cover almost makes the music that, that much great. better. Yeah. So yeah, I even got a t-shirt. So Thunder Seven Triumph. I saw him on that tour. Actually, that was that was pretty popular. I seen him on that tour too. And I I still have a, an original t-shirt from that tour of that album cover. Oh, wow. Ralph, was that is it shit uh, on as much as I think it is? Or I, I think people said that they didn't like it as much as Allied Forces, um, which, you know, you, you're never going to top that album. Uh, but I, I thought it did pretty well. But I don't I don't people don't like talk about it much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, whenever you look back on Triumph, like that never comes up. I think it's a really solid album. I, I, I like it. I think it's really good. Spellbound's a great song. Yeah. 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 It was it was definitely more commercial than Allied Forces, I think. Maybe that's why people kind of came down on a bit. But uh, Ralph, did you see them at the Civic Center? I'm trying to remember if that was Civic no, Center I, or that, Meadowlands. That tour was the Meadowlands with Loudness and Mountain. Okay. I thought it was at that one. Yeah. Because I think, I think I saw them... Uh, because I saw them at the Civic Center also. I'm just trying to remember when. And I saw them on Allied Forces at the Palladium. Uh, but I definitely saw the Loudness and Mountain show as well. Uh, at that. I saw them twice at the Meadowlands and maybe once at Nassau Coliseum. But uh, yeah, great, great live band too. You know, they, big production and everything like that. It's cool stuff. Good choice. Chris. Uh, my, <laughs> next, uh, my next pick is one that uh, I was talking about the topic over the weekend with Craig. And he uh, he gave me the the suggestion. We we were talking about a band uh, that I really loved that broke up, and then they had a very successful reunion, 
and then they did they quickly rushed and banged out another record that apparently the record company was pushing them to uh hurry up and do and it shit the bed they broke up again and uh the um shit i think i grabbed the wrong one yeah fuck i grabbed <laughs> god damn it i was in a rush all right i grabbed archetype from fear factory but that's the uh the popular one that was the reunion one uh that did really well transgression was the quickly uh recorded follow-up uh, i'm sure ralph has it uh, Never i have like ralph three can. copies in the garage <laughs> that's where he's running to uh, i had two so, weeks yeah. to prepare i, don't, I, don't I had 30 is. minutes <laughs> <laughs> Damn, there's a lot going on man i'm watching goddamn fucking chucky movies like crazy i am chucky the fuck out okay. <laughs> fuck chucky <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I like it, man. I, I like it. I, I mean, it's definitely uh, got a, a, a rawer sound than the uh, the previous records. Uh, it's less polished, uh, uh, mm. but also less industrial sounding. You know, the songs are are, are slower. So, um, you know, the the band have said that they weren't finished when they put it out, uh, but it came out, and it you know they toured their asses off of the for archetype they they seem to tour a little less for uh transgression because it was kind of a kind of a bomb and then they fucking broke up again so yeah that's my uh my number two cool craig all right mine this one this one is almost always uh considered with it with a group of of uh this artist's albums to be ones that people either really really love or the, or they really hate and i happen to really love it so my choice is alice cooper's flush the fashion i love this album it's uh people say it's you know oh, it's new new wavy with this the, the synth line and clones is really the only new waviness you'll find on this a lot of it is just is good good guitar rock and you're in and out in like 30 minutes on this T 10 songs 30 minutes All, the songs are a lot of fun uh, and uh, even though Alice is like bombed out of his mind or or whatever, doesn't remember recording them, the uh, his humor is still there with the lyrics, with songs like Grim Facts and Headlines and Clones. The cover of Talk Talk is is great, but uh, uh, such a fun album, and and uh, I I love hearing hearing the songs from it. And it was one of those where. I my, myself just reading things it was like oh I everybody says this album is bad so therefore I I won't buy it and then I when I finally did get a copy I was kind of like I thought this album was supposed to suck I I really like it you know and then uh I'm I I'm like most of his other you know blackout year years albums as well but uh flush the fashion is my is my favorite of those and uh and if 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 you're if you're like me and you didn't want to give it a shot just based on things that you'd read, give it a give it a try. Don't be a bad sheep and you know and just you know give it give it a listen. You might you might really enjoy it if you if you are a fan of some of uh, other Alice albums from around that period. I think you'd really like this. It's it is guitar oriented and the songs are a lot of fun. I'm still up in the air about all those Blackout era albums. I like them. I don't dislike them. Like the yeah, I don't yeah, dislike they're them. All, they're a fun listen, but yeah. There's, it's, there's it's something the missing stuff. from me. I don't know what it is. There's something from those albums that's missing. Maybe it's that whole dark gothic thing. Uh, I don't know what it is. I listen to them and they all sound really kind of cold to me. I don't know. So, I, I mean, I don't I don't care as much for the Dada album, but but Flush of Fashion and Zipper Catches Skin, I, I really like. I, I think that's a really... A, a, a strong I mean, zipper catches skin is my favorite out of all of them yeah, yeah. special yeah. forces is the one that i think is the most new wavy out, oh, out of all is, of yeah. them yeah, but that's pretty that good one, too but that one has a lot of good songs too especially the bookend songs on that uh, vis uh vicious rumors uh, to end it with and who do we think we are uh the first the first song right all right so we're gonna go to japan this time and uh this is a case of a band that was always weird since day one, and they've been weird all along for like 30 years now. But this time they put out an album that was, I think, too weird. And uh, even people I know that like this band have kind of written this album off as too weird. So the band is Psy. Uh, so Psy came around early 90s. Actually, it just occurred to me they were one of the first bands 
signed to uh, From Mayhem. Uh, the the murdered guitarist Geronimus had a record label called Death Like Silence, and one of the first bands he reached out to was Psy. So they started as a black metal band, but even from day one, they were a very weird band. They sounded like no other black metal, uh, and they quickly kind of went into like different realms. Uh, they put out a couple albums, and then they signed to Century Media in 2001. They put out an album called Imaginary Sonic Scape, which kind of blew them up, which kind of you know brought them a lot bigger fan base. I think it's their best album, and obviously having a pretty big label helps. Uh, so they take a couple years off, and then they come back with an album that Century Media would not release because it was they completely dropped black metal and went into this very 60s stoner, psychedelic, clean vocal. Uh, and the album was called Gallows Gallery from 2005. Uh, and this is the original with the red cover. And I say that because this, uh, even the band thought this, this original version, it sounds like it's recorded under 30 feet of mud with like a nice thick layer of concrete on top. Uh, I remember when I bought it, when it came out, I'm like, all right, I guess this is, uh, I had, I had to work at it because the music is very catchy. Uh, it's, it's think some of the catchiest stuff they ever did. This, the vocals, the way the songs are put together. Fantastic. Absolutely fucking love it. But man, it, it is a struggle to get to this original master. But the band immediately pushed to, because uh, they hated it too, so they immediately pushed to have it redone. So I think only two or three years after that came out, they reissued it with this blue album, blue artwork. Uh, and this is the remastered version. It's like night and day. This one's totally listenable. Still a little raw, a little rough. Uh, definitely has like a very live in the rehearsal room feel. But yeah, this, it's, it, this is like 0% black metal at this point. They'd already kind of been trending away from that. But it's all clean singing. Uh, like I said, very stoner rock, very, very 60s, very psychedelic. Uh, but yeah, this is just a, to me, one of their best albums. It's so catchy. Uh, but like I said, just because it's so weird and the original version kind of left that bad taste in people's mouths because it really did sound like a big sh- a stack of fucking mud. Uh, it just always kind of got buried in their discography. And I, you know, I know people that like the band have said it's just it's just too weird, which to me is kind of strange to say about a band where every album they've done is weird. Because after this... They've put out uh, a good handful more albums, and none of them are like straight up like regular heavy metal. It's always this weird, you know, instruments, all kinds of shit going on. Uh, some of them kind of have like a circus music sound, and some of them have this very grim, like kind of evil sound. But it's like you never know what you're going to get with Psy. And this was probably a case where I don't think anybody saw this coming, but yeah. I haven't heard this version. I actually had to go back and listen to the original because I haven't heard it in a couple of years before the show just to remember what it sounded like. Oh, yeah, that's. That's like a little sandpaper on the ears. But yeah, fortunately, this version is uh, rectifies all that and uh, night and day different. And Aaron's second choice was, uh, I don't know, I don't hear people really trash the sound, although obviously following the six that came before it, uh, it's understandably not as well loved, but it's a technical ecstasy by Sabbath. Uh, I think it's a good album. Uh, I know the next album is Aloe's favorite, uh, but... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I've never, I think most diehard Sabbath fans, I don't really hear a lot of people trashing technical ecstasy, you know. Uh, is it Sabbath Body Sabbath? No. Is it a good album? Yeah, I think so. I throw it on a lot, so. Yeah, I like it. I've never had an issue. When it came after it, though. Never Say Die. Yeah, it's a bit better than you never say die. Yeah, for sure. I think it's definitely better. But yeah, it, it comes after six arguably perfect albums. So, you know, that's. That's a high uh high bar to crust for any band. So, but yeah, I still think it's great. So, but that was her second choice. Cool. Ralph. Right. Um, so yeah, this band I talked about before too. Here's their first album, Owls Eve. And then their second album, another great album. Both of these are so classic. I played the hell out of these when I was a kid. But then the third album comes out in 1988, same year as the Crumb Suckers one. But look at that awful album cover. Monument. Yeah. There's other two like super metal looking album covers, and I don't know what the fuck this is supposed to be. Some some lady with nice gloves on or whatever. But uh, this is a great album though. It they they got they do a Queen song that kind of doesn't really fit that great on the album. And then they do a little bit like of a goofy song at the end of the album, like the joke song. But I go to this all the time because I played the other ones out so much as a kid that this is refreshing to hear this. And uh, I liked it at the time when it came out, but I could see why people didn't like it as much. But as time gone on, has gone on, I really love this album and appreciate it. And, um, you know, they broke up after this because I, I think it was a, like a failure for them But uh, at the time. But I think it's it's held up good now. And, uh, I, I go back to it all the time. 
I think they were hoping at the time that that album was going to appeal to a uh, more mainstream metal audience. That's what they were yeah. hoping for anyway. It didn't quite work out that way. Probably should have. Yeah, they, they should have just stayed the way they were going and they were like the kings of what they were doing and, and they should have embraced that and, and they would have had a longer career. It definitely has cleaned up a lot from the first two albums, but it's uh, still got its good, heavy, really brutal parts to it. I like it a lot. Yep. All right, my next pick. Uh, this album followed a pretty big album, which itself followed a massively big album. But when this album came out, people were kind of like, ah, that's not as good as those last two albums. And people just ignored it and said it sucked. And just kind of like the band went into like a little bit of a kind of like a downturn for a couple of years. But now, all these years later, I actually think this album is better than the album everybody thought that came before. It was so great. And that's uh, ACDC's Flick of the Switch. Yep. You know, it's funny. Back in the day, you know, we all loved Back in Black. And I think we all loved For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, because we were supposed to. And then this came out and this didn't have Mutt Lang and the production was a little bit different. It was more like the early stuff. And uh, we were all kind of like, ah, whatever, you know, we were maybe moving on to other things, but like all these years later, man, you have you, when was the last time you guys went and listened to for those about to rock? It's really not that good. Um, yeah, not that better. good. And I'd, I'd argue this is a better album. I would agree. Better. This for is those a, about to rock. It's like, they did, you could tell that they were trying to recapture back in black. Yeah. And the songs aren't really all that great. There's a couple of really good ones, but as a whole, it's not that great. Uh, whereas this, this, I mean, House is on Fire, the title track, um, Landslide, there's some really good bangers on this album. And, you know, the band produced it, so it doesn't quite sound as big and powerful, but I think this album holds up really, really well. And the album covers shit, right, of course, but uh, still, I don't know. I think this is really good. I think people have warmed up to this a little bit more over the years, but man, back then, nobody gave a shit about this at all, which is kind of sad, but uh, I, I've always thought it was pretty good. What do you Pete, think fly on the wall? Mention. It was one of my honorable mentions. So I had that ready to oh, go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And this well, that was one this was one of my honorable mentions because it just like flick of the switch, it's like basically forgotten. They yeah. they never play the songs live and people just dump on it. And it's like, well, I I personally think it's better than for those about to rock. Yeah. You know, yeah. I wish Flick of the Switch though started with Guns for Hire, though, or put the put the songs on side two and make them side one. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, just because Rising Power is not a very good opener, but uh, but yeah, that album crushes. I love it. Yeah, it's really good, really good. All right, Jamie, back to you. All right, I was talking about Thunder Seven. How I didn't realize how people didn't think too much of it until I joined this community. You know what other album I didn't know people shit on so much until I joined this? I could almost include it. Almost fucking the wall. <laughs> so many people i had no idea hate this album and think it's full of filler so i could almost include it but i won't <laughs> um my next three were low-hanging fruit they're famous for being hated and i kind of like them some of them i love and this is real low-hanging fruit i am gonna go with hold your fire by rush nice i hate yeah. that fucking record <laughs> yeah I know you do. I mean, Force 10, Time oh, Stand Still I like is that. one of the best songs of the 80s, let alone Rush songs. <laughs> oh, man, come on. Uh, the Lock and Key, The Mission. This is a good, solid album. Yes, it's it sounds, you know, they went maybe a little too far, some people say, with the keyboards and in the new wavy sound, but I really dig it. I did see this tour, I remember. And, uh, you know, if you want to know what the tour sounded like, just listen to uh, a show of hands. Yeah. And I do remember being 17 years old and the dude was in front of me on the floor with it. In the back of his t-shirt was the uh, Farewell to King Skull and it was looking all badass. And I remember listening to what they were playing and looking at the skull and going, just doesn't match the skull anymore, does it? This music <laughs> is clashing now. But as time has gone on, I love it more and more. So, yeah, hold your fire. Yeah, it's my I, I think I've agreed with everybody's picks so far, except that. I hate that. <laughs> Wait till my next two, motherfucker. 
<laughs> yeah, I just I I have really softened up on power windows, but man, hold your fire. Same. I just yeah. yeah it's still a shitter. Yeah, although Force Ten is a good song, but uh, Force yeah. Ten is good. Yeah, that I like. That I like. Chris, what were you swatting flies before? I see you like. Yeah, no, I knocked something over. And... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I you're clean up. up one of these days. All right, uh, my number number three, and I do have a. Uh, I grabbed like four or five other honorable mentions. Um, this guy, his career was pretty much dead. Uh, he killed it himself. Uh, Craig mentioned him on the think in the last episode, but he had a huge comeback in two thousand, uh, and then the follow up record kind of shit the bed. Uh, people did not like it as much. A lot of people blamed the production um but i i, I kind of like the record then and i still like it now i have the original version uh this is the remixed and remastered version of crucible from 2002 uh this is rob halford's uh follow-up record to um uh, resurrection uh i i liked it then it was a uh a darker uh moodier record uh than the the first one definitely less of an in your face Judas Priest style metal record uh, but I really dug it uh, but I knew a lot of people back then that did not like it and they specifically blamed the production and uh, you know Halford toured his ass off for Resurrection and uh, he kind of shit the bed on the second record I'll never forget one of the greatest tours that I saw that uh, got cancelled for poor ticket sales and I don't even remember the full lineup but it was Halford, Testament, Immortal, Primal Rage, Pain Museum, and I think Symphony X, and maybe like one other band. And um, it, the tour lasted like a fucking week, and I saw it in New York City, and um, it was one of those things, it was kind of depressing, because it was this big like six, six or eight week US metal tour, and like at the show, everybody was like, yeah, uh, we just found out uh, tonight's the last night of the tour. Everybody's got a fucking fl- primal rage was pissed off because they were losing all this money. And uh, yeah, Immortal came over for nothing. And yeah, all this. Um, but uh, but yeah, the record did not do nearly as well or uh, was not nearly as well received as uh, Resurrection. Weren't they like, like, like... Yeah, okay. I was going to say ticket sales were only like a couple hundred. Like uh, they were ticket oh, sales. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. They they were supposed to play the chance and that tour that show never happened and yeah, that's what yeah. I got a ticket sub for is the chance show. Oh okay. Yeah, yeah. The same thing. I was gonna go see it at the chance. It got canceled and yeah. I, I didn't go to the city for it. I was gonna I was lucky. Uh me and me and Frank White went down to the city, interview bands and take pictures at BB King's, which was a fun place to see shows back then. And yeah, it was um and I don't remember if they did two nights at BB King's. Or it was just one night, and then they canceled the second night. But after New York City, the rest of the tour got shit canned, and everybody was like, "Wow!" And it was one of those head scratchers, like, "How could a lineup like that um, get canceled?" But it, you know, it did. Which is weird because I bet I bet anything if you put that same lineup together today, especially Halford and Immortal, uh, it would it would sell like fucking hotcakes. I mean, Hal, Halford, Immortal, and Testament. I mean, that's that a, guaranteed that's a great, that would sell well. You'd be, you'd be selling out some decent sized places with that. I mean, yeah. Immortal went out on their own and packed everywhere they played, right? I mean, it's just, I've Absolutely. seen them. I've seen Immortal a couple of times. I mean, now it's not, you know, it's a different lineup, but, yeah, you yeah. know, just having the name back over here, having those guys play here again, I, they would sell well. Yeah. Yeah, hmm. yeah it is what it is. Craig. All right, and last one here is a guy with a pretty big catalog, and and usually when you, if you read rankings of, of his of his albums this one is towards the bottom and i, I don't know why i mean uh I, it's not as it's not his best but it sure as hell ain't his worst my choice is uh ted nugent's if you can't lick him lick him yeah. and uh yeah t- bad album cover he doesn't use the low his his uh trademark cursive logo which is which uh mistake by not doing it but it, all the they're all uh, reasonably heavy guitar rocky uh songs is it as good as his albums from 75 to 80? No, but I'll tell you, it's it's a lot better than Detroit, uh, Muscle, the, the music made me do it, Little Miss Dangerous, Nugent, I mean, uh, Spirit of the Wild kind of blows. So, I mean, this this one I, I, I always liked. 
uh, a majority of the songs on it. Yeah, there's a there's like a, a bluesy one that I don't care, a slow bluesy one I don't really care for. And then there's one that's co-written by Bon Jovi, which sounds like a Bon Jovi song, and that that's not good. But the the rest of them are pretty pretty good, fun, uh, heavy songs. Fun Lover, uh, Skin Tight. The title track is really cool. Uh, bass courtesy of Chuck Wright from Quiet Riot. Drums by Pat Torpy, later of Mr. Big. So uh, it's a good lineup. Ted sings all the songs and he doesn't do any kind of jokey, exaggerated, goofy singing style like he does sometimes on, on his later albums. So no, I, I think it's pretty good. It's, maybe it's kind of a guilty pleasure, but but uh, I think it's a decent decent album from Uncle Ted. I think you take tour short. And people would stop me all the time because I, I can't remember if the girl was on the front or the back of the shirt, but people would like, they'd like, what, 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 what is that? Because yeah, I, I, I like well, the record the, too. Well, even the the CD That's reissue, wrong. the CD reissue, has <laughs> just That's has, just the pants. That was it, not the know? picture on the shirt. I remember <laughs> it, was, it was a close up picture of Ted, and then the album cover, and people would always laugh if you if you can't lick them, lick them. Yeah, those albums are so spotty. I think if you take all the best songs from all those 80s albums, you got a pretty good record right there, you know, for the most part. All right, Ryan. All right, I get to I get to talk about one of my favorite bands here. So uh we're gonna go to the nineties up to Canada. So uh, you know, this is a band that they, they weren't priests, they weren't maiden, but they did have those two nineties albums with a different singer that it was just you know slim pickings, hard times for them. Uh, but they got through and the first album uh, was the worst of the two. I think the worst one they ever did, but they came back better on the second one. Uh, and that band is Voivod. And this is their 1997 album, Phobos. So in the 80s, they released consecutively, I think, probably my favorite run of metal albums ever. You know, starting in 84, going up to the end of the decade with 89, Nothing Face. Then they did Angel Rat and Outer Limits, which are much more like weird prog rock, kind of like alternative rock. Just just great albums, though. Very original, unique. Uh, then uh, the the bass player, Blackie, one of my favorite bass players ever, he left before Outer Limits, so he's gone. And then after that, their vocalist, uh, Snake, left. So now they're just down to the guitarist, Piggy, my favorite guitarist ever, which I think I've said about 40,000 times on the show, and drummer, Away, who's the only guy that's been in the band for their whole duration. So they hired bass player and vocalist. They replaced both with one dude, this guy named Eric Forrest. Uh, sounds totally different. Snake has a very unique kind of like, he just, there's no other metal vocalist that sounds like him. You hear him, you know, oh, that's Snake and that's Voivod. You know, never really did any bands outside of Voivod. So his voice is immediately just identifiable with them. Uh, this guy has a much gruffer sound. Uh, Eric wasn't a bad vocalist, but it wasn't really as distinct. You know, uh, the music went from being like this kind of weird, froggy, not even really metal where they were going. Uh, they go back to like this very hard, heavy, uh, industrial, almost kind of industrial sounding thing. Uh, so you say, oh, they're going back to how they sounded. But no, it didn't sound like the earlier stuff at all. It just had this whole different sound. So in 95, they put out this album called Negatron. Uh, I hate to say it. I think it's their worst album. I hate to pick it's like picking a worst. It's like picking like your least favorite kid because I love the band so much. But arguably, it's probably their worst. And then in 97, they come back with Phobos. Uh, and it's like they refined it a little bit. Same idea. It's like this industrial, heavy, thrashy, very dissonant, very atonal. Uh, you know, Piggy was doing stuff. He always had a unique style. Uh, but even on the 80s stuff, it could be melodic. A lot of his leads were melodic and it was real catchy. Uh, this it's just more like this wall of sound, uh, but it works. Uh, I think this has a roar and more like harsh sound than the first one they did with Eric, which I like. You know, it just kind of fits it better. Uh, but yeah, it's just a cool album, but. You know, much like Priest and Maiden, you know, they had these couple albums in the 90s that, you know, some people like them, but generally it's like after this, uh, Eric left and uh, actually Jason Newstead joined the band on bass. And then, so then Snake came back and in 2003, they put out a self-titled album just called Voivod, uh, which was, again, a totally different sound it had almost like a, uh, I don't know, it, they went back to like more of a rock and roll sound for a little while, which now they've gone back to like a metal sound because they change all the time, but yeah, like this era of the band was forgotten. And only on the most recent tour I saw uh, did they finally reintroduce, they played a single song off this, a song called Rise, which was cool to hear live because by the time I was able to go see Voivod in the early 2000s, uh, they, this stuff was already like gone off the set list. You know, it's like it never happened. So yeah, just a really cool album. Uh, would I put it in one of my favorite albums by them? No, but this is a band. It's like, you know, it could be like their eighth best album 
Uh, and it's still fucking awesome because just the ones above it are just that awesome. You know, they're just that much that good of a band. So and for a band that has some of my favorite cover or artwork ever, their drummer away does all their artwork always has since the demo. Uh, this is one of my lesser favorite uh, covers from them. But it's, you know, it's still very Voivod looking at like this weird sci fi horror. Uh, it's totally in line with what they've always had. Just not as iconic as some of their more uh, 80s stuff. And uh, Karen's last pick, I think she decided. I said, I don't know. She didn't send me any, any order, but I figured I'd do this one last because it's the most uh, interesting of the picks is Kiss, Music from the Elder. Number one. A good pick. I knew somebody was going to pick it. You know, <laughs> yeah. so many people love that album, come around on that album now, that it barely qualifies. Yeah, I feel like it's, uh, I mean, I heard it, obviously I'm younger, so I heard it many years after the fact. When I first heard it, I'm like, this isn't so bad. I mean, but I had no expectations because I already kind of knew what it was about before I ever heard it. So I just went into it not blind. I'm like, all right, this is kind of fun, you know, different, you know. People but, uh, watched that album back in the day. I was going to say, I know when it came out, it was like, a, you know, like everybody's favorite whipping post. But yeah, that that has become the album now that everybody loves uh, yeah. because it's so misunderstood, I guess. And maybe just people realize it's real after all these years. It's not as bad as we all thought it was. It really isn't. Um, but it's just it's a weird kiss album still. It is weird. But it's, but it's got, it's got I would say thing. back when we were kids, the wall was here. The elder was here. And over the 40 years, it's been like this almost, which is fucking ridiculous. The Wall's one of the best albums ever recorded. And the Elder sucks. <laughs> it does not. <laughs> I can't believe people trash the Wall. I mean, it's not my favorite Pink Floyd album, but it's good. It's a good I album. I, You're I trashed it. all the time. I I like oh. I like a good chunk of it. I think it's a little overrated myself, but it's, it's long. Yeah. It's long, but no one says you got to listen to the whole thing in one city like yeah all right ralph i gotta i gotta say that i i love negatron i think negatron was great when it came out because uh you know you had these two really experimental voivod albums and then they had you know members leave and stuff but when negatron came out it was really heavy again so it was just a return to the heaviness that i loved about it but uh i i think people didn't like that um they kind of had like almost like a pantera-ish kind of sound i not really pantera-ish but just like um a little more slamming kind of metal sound but i have to stick up for negatron really quick but all right i think the line so of I changes think, i think the line of changes hurt them i think. I, I should yeah. clarify i do like it a lot but i like everything else they've done more because they're like on a lot of days they're my favorite band so nobody ever talks about those albums there's like they were so ignored at the time I, I yeah that's both of them. I thought he was a great fit for the band, and to have one guy replace two guys, I like that. It's kind of going to go that way. But. I saw him solo. When he played some stuff. I was out in uh, Cleveland with Keeler in like 2004 for a Brave Words Fest, and uh, his uh, Eric's other band, E Force, played. This was after he was in Voivod, and he did, if I recall, he did some Voivod stuff uh, in addition to his own solo stuff at that time. But yeah, I like the album. It's just that I like every other album better. But I, I had a just, chance to see that lineup. They were playing with uh, the band Crisis that I love down in the city, but for some reason I can't remember why I couldn't make it. But um, I saw, so, yeah, I was watching. Uh, you know, Karen and Pete did the Church of Misery uh, ranking, and uh, which was really good. But uh, I was, you know, kind of upset that like you were talking about like how many engineers that they kind of fit with metal. They do doom metal and stoner metal. They could be. You left out one of the the things is murder metal. Oh. Now, this band Macabre that I'm going to talk about, they they've been singing. You know, you 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 guys talked about how unique it was that each song was about a serial killer for Church of Misery. Macabre has been doing that since 1985, and they're they're one of my all time favorite bands. But their their latest album, Carnival of Killers, uh, took a beating with people like uh they they didn't like it he he has a clean singing voice at times and he's used it before in the past but on this album he uses it quite a bit more but they still got some really heavy parts to it and um they still got the whole concept with all the serial killers here's an album they did where it's like uh sinister slaughter it's like the sergeant pepper's yeah, album pepper. cover 
except for it's all serial killers in the background. <laughs> and they did a whole album dedicated to Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, the, every song is about like from him being a kid to growing up and doing what he did. But yeah, this Carnival of Souls, I, I like it. I think it's really cool, but I, I could, it's not, it's probably my least favorite album, but the way people have shit on it, I, I think it's still great. And I think they're such a unique band and there's no one, there's one song they sing in French in here, which I don't like. And then there's another song that um, it's like the them bones song, but they, um, they, it, it's, it's cool the first time you listen to it, but then it gets a little tiresome. It'd be like a song that I would skip. But besides that, I think it's great. But uh, I know they're coming back with like a really hard and heavy album for the next album because the reaction that they got from this album, but uh I still, I still think it's really cool, and they're still one of my all-time favorite bands. I tell you, you know what's cool about that band is they look goofy and they have that image, but those three guys are like, like they can play like King Crimson songs, like like nobody's been. Like they are such fucking awesome and tight musicians. Oh, definitely. And nobody's you like oh. Like you the go back guy. to the first demo. The first demo, they got a guitar solo, solo like single guitar solo, a single drum solo, a single bass solo. This is back on their demo they were doing that. I mean, they're, all three of them are virtuoso. And to be a three-piece and still have the same lineup since, like, 1985 is Yeah, like almost 40 crazy. years, yeah. Crazy. It's yeah. unbelievable. It, like, the, uh, the, the, uh, the drummer, Dennis the, Dennis the Menace. But, yeah, that dude is, like, one of the best drummers in metal. And, yeah, you yeah, never see him, like, oh, you know, named with, like, Dave Lombardo and these other guys. But, yeah, like you said, they are virtuoso musicians and because of like the band and the goofiness and like the image and the serial killers you know that's just never mentioned no one's like oh macabre you know you're thinking like really really like you know phenomenal musicians but i put those three guys up against anybody in metal like they really are on that level but dennis ritchie dennis the menace is always in my top five drummers of all time the dude is phenomenal he's like tight and clean but like he can play as fast as anybody but like just very tasty little fills and you know a lot of stuff on the hi hat, you know. I, I love all that. You know, those guys doing it, doing it back then. Like I remember when Rain and Blood came out, we were like, "That's it. You can't, you can't play ha- faster than that. That's the limit." You know. And then I heard someone had the the shitless demo by uh, Macabre, and I thought it was a machine. I was like, "That that can't be real. Like you can't play that fast." Now there's plenty of drummers that play that speed, yeah. but uh, well, back assistance, then, yeah. they 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 raised the bar at that time. There's no triggers or anything on that old stuff. Yeah. That's that's uh yeah those guys are fucking rule great band nice all right my next choice uh I picked one of their albums but it could be a whole bunch of them actually um sometimes you know we kind of talked a little bit about it on the Voivod pick you know when uh, a band's lineup really changes drastically even to the point where there really aren't any original members left people tend to be like ah I'm not listening to that anymore and that's the case with this band here that I'm going to talk about. Although all of the albums they've released since they're no longer appears to any original members are really, really good. If you just think of them in a different way, the band is Molly Hatchet. I picked Warriors of the Rainbow Bridge as just one example. Uh, you know, you got this guy, Bobby Ingram, who joined the band's like five albums in. He was part of... Um, their old lead singers band when he left for a little bit, Danny Joe Brown. And he basically took up the mantle of the band and Danny Joe Brown came back and then they had and Dave Lubeck came back and then everybody else either died or left the band, whatever. And he's just carried on as Molly Hatchet with, you know, for a while, a singer who sounds just like Danny Joe Brown and he died. Now they got someone else. So long story short, should it be called Molly Hatchet anymore? I don't know, but you know what? These are really still good hard rock and southern rock albums that sound like molly hatchet albums right but they just don't contain any original members anymore but i think they're really really good people either shit on them or they don't even bother listening to them but i've got them all and they're all really really good so uh i think it's totally overlooked yeah i only heard them like i only listened to that later stuff like maybe like two or three years ago and i'm like yeah this is fucking like great heavy like nasty southern rock but yeah no one may like when people talk about like the great southern rock bands like that later molly hatchet just it does not come up ever. In yeah, because people are like, no, nope, sorry, no original members. I'm not listening anymore, right? It's like, yeah, and I, I get that. But if you just take it out of your head that it's called Molly Hatch and just listen to it, if you like good, heavy Southern rock, that's what it is. The songs are good. There's great guitar playing. There's it just it's, it's cranking stuff, but people just can't get past that, right? You know, if you give it another name, 
people would be like, oh, it's a great album, right? But it's, it can't be a great Molly Hatchet album. So whatever. All right. Why don't we uh, fire off some honorable mentions here now? Uh, Jamie, you, you got some left? Yeah, my two biggies at the end here. Okay. A lot of people hate these equally, too. Risk by Megadeth and Turbo by Judas Priest. Yeah, if Bryce know, was here, if Bryce was here, he would have picked that Megadeth album, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of good songs. Yeah, it's not thrash metal. But that's no. all right. There's some heavier stuff on here and doomier stuff like Prince of Darkness. I tell you what, if I owned a hockey team, my team would come out every home game to crush them. It's perfect for opening a hockey game. It kind of was. I almost feel like it was written. With, I know they actually wrote it for this fucking stupid Universal Soldier movie, but it kind of is perfect for like the yeah to bring a team out. It just has yeah, like that yeah, yeah. Team crush like, them. Uh, and you get the crowd going into it. I just think that even the mellower songs like Wonderlust and uh, and Breadline are just really well written songs. If you don't think oh, it's not Megadeth like Thrash, uh, it's still good songs. And I always like Turbo. Yeah, it's their hair metal album, but I think it's fun. I mean, Parental Guidance, I was 15, 16 going, yeah, we don't need no Parental Guidance. You know, it's cheesy, but I, I, I think Turbo Lover is a great song. Out in the Cold, Wild Nights, and Hot Crazy Days. I, I think it's a really solid album. Oh, and real quick, Astra by Asia, I think is on par with the debut. And a lot of people say the Kinks went out on a bad note i think phobia is a pretty good solid album to go okay. out yeah i will say that asia album is better than that second album Woo. oh it's so much better than alpha oh, yeah sure yeah turbo i've warmed up the turbo a little bit i still think it's not great but i i i can listen to it now and i don't i don't hate it like i used to i used to be like oh my god this is terrible but you know chris was shaking his head chris is like no yeah. you're not sold out in yeah, the cold i think it's Take down, down and just and Nostradamus. Just throw the three of them in the um, I you know what, Chris? I will listen to Turbo every day if I never have to hear Nostradamus again. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll take that. You're right. Turbo. I will because it's down. shorter. It's only one record. So I'll take <laughs> Nostradamus. I'll take Turbo over Nostradamus any day. There you go. Yeah, Nostradamus is, is terrible. Oof. No good. All right, you got any left, Chris? Yeah, I got a couple. Uh everybody <laughs> fucking hated this record when it came out. Uh, but people have warmed to it now, and yeah, in the in the 2000s, the band played uh, quite a few tracks from this record. Uh, Another perfect day for Motorhead. Everybody fucking hated this way back when, but then the people did seem to warm it, warm to it. Which is uh, good because it's a great fucking album. Yeah, yeah well, I think it's a great it's record. Good. You know, it's, it, when you listen to it now, you're like, why did everybody fucking hate it so much? It's not even like it's light; it's fucking heavy. It yeah. totally is. It's not a. It's, people it's people thought that that was such a step down from Iron Fist, and I think it's such a step up from Iron Fist. It's a better album. Than Iron Fist. I don't it's think Iron Fist is all that good. I yeah. like Iron Fist. I think that's I another agree, example. Like, oh, of, you bastard! Yes, that's a great album. It's it's just another example of a lineup change that people were so against, right? They, that they never gave the album a chance. It's like you know, yeah. no, no, Fast Eddie, uh, the Thin Lizzy guy. This can't be good, right? And. But now all these years later, I was like, oh, that's a pretty damn good album. Yeah. Oh, well, he's actually a great fucking guitar album. player, you know, but whether yeah. I did with the band. But but that one album, he was awesome. Yeah. And then you see pictures of him wearing shorts on stage. And, and, and antagonizing and, Lemmy. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's a whole different well, thing. Yeah. But yeah. music, I mean, his, his, his guitar playing was awesome. Yeah. Well, even on the one Motorhead live album, uh, I think uh, Lemmy says, uh, here's another song from Another Perfect Day. And the crowd the crowd says something. And then he goes, oh, now you love it. Back then, I, could, I couldn't uh, I couldn't get rid I couldn't uh, give it away. And now yeah, 100%. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, another one I got that uh, I remember getting a promo cassette tape of this in 1988 from a guy at uh, Noise Records, and he's like, "Well, maybe you'll like it," but he's like, "Wait till you see how the band looks." And uh, yeah, this is a controversial one, but I think I like it better than the record before. Uh, Celtic Frost, Cold Lake. Wow, uh, that album sucks ass. <laughs> I wish I had more oh, copies of it because this goes for a pretty penny now. Yes, it does. Um, it's worth a lot of money because Tom Warrior hates it and he won't reissue he it. He hates it too. Yeah, yeah. he will not he, reissue it. No, no. But I don't think it's all that bad. Listen, you I like, like, you like that better than Into the Pandemonium? When fucking Tom G. Warrior starts starts singing like a sick moose on Into the well, Pandemonium. Well, yeah, that moany, that moany like, vocal uh, uh, yeah. he, I, I think he sounds like that on Cold Lake. Like he's singing like Cherry Orchards. It's like, man, somebody get a it. A little bit, but it's good. Right you know, but I think what really sealed, what really fucking put the nail in the coffin was the 
the big hair and the lipstick and the fucking LA gun shirts. It was like, oh, dude, go fuck yourself. Oh, no one photo they did with the you know his pubes hanging yeah. out. You know, that's a for sure iconic. Uh, this one, history. this one is a band that when I was a kid I loved, and over time, uh, I really I don't give a fuck about them except this one record, uh, the Motley Crue record with John Karabi. Uh, people debate this one all the time, but this is the only Motley Crue record I still listen to. And uh, the last one uh, was a when this came out, I didn't buy it because everybody said it sucked. And I was like, well, there's no reason to buy it because the band broke up. And then like six months later, I was in Camelot Music at the mall and they had it on cassette in the budget bin for like a buck ninety nine. And I bought it. And I'm like, this record's fucking great. And it's a swan song from Carcass. Oh, hell yeah. You know, definitely their... Uh, you know they they moved away became more of a, of a death and roll thing but uh, but i really like this record and same thing you know everybody hated it back then but now whenever they tour they always play uh, a track or two uh from swan song and yeah, yeah those are my those are my honorables cool greg my only one was uh since since uh karen by absence had brought up uh, kiss uh you know and there's any any number of albums i think that you could that you could bring up from them that you know people have an opinion of like uh carnival of souls which i i think is actually pretty good a lot of people seem to hate that but uh but my choice for them is actually their last two uh sonic boom and monsters there's so many people that just will not even bother to give these a listen because it's tommy thayer and eric singer replacing uh, Ace Fraley and Peter Chris, respectively. But the song, the albums are are actually really good. They're they're they it's they sound like Kiss uh, as albums from like the you know from the seventies ish. I mean, it's like they have uh, pretty they they used analog production and there's no ballads uh, at all. Gene, uh, all four of the members sing uh, 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 different songs on it, and uh, Tommy and Eric actually sing pretty well, and they're they're decent songs. But uh, you know, a lot of people just just won't even give them a try because it's like, well, it's not Ace and Peter, or but then it's like, but then they're okay with lick it up and animalize and things like that. It's like, well, they weren't on those either. <laughs> yeah, but they got the same makeup on. I think that's what turns people off. The yeah. Month. But, but Sonic Boom is great. I think it's but if you just, Monster, you know, eh. Sonic Boom you just, is a good just, rock. But if you just album. listen, you know, but I think it's like, you know, uh, Monster, I mean, with uh, Hell and Hallelujah and uh, uh, The Devil is Me and eat, eat Your Heart Out. I mean, they're, they're, they're decent songs. It's like, you know, so I mean, it's and it's like if you just listen and it's like, don't worry about who the hell's playing guitar because in hey, plus in some of those Kiss albums. I don't know who the hell's playing guitar, you know, or drums on them anyway. So what difference does it make? So that's true. true. I think they're both solid records, and uh, I I almost picked Dynasty because a lot of people shit on that, and I, I never I thought that was a bad album. Oh, it's Kiss and Disco album. That's like, well, you got the one song, but the rest of it's still good. That's a good song. Yeah. I thought Craig was going to pick that when he says he likes to tear it up on the dance floor. I'm like, oh, here comes well, Dynasty. I, well, I, <laughs> I will I, tell you, I, I was. Well, I do. <laughs> I was at a wedding recently, and that song came on, and I said it. I was very sweaty by the end of it. A lot of well, I had, I had, the, I had these, I had these, I had these on hand too. You know, you so, go, you know Dynasty and and Unmasked. You know, but uh, but yeah, same Unmasked. thing. It's like you know, they say you know, Dynasty is a disco album, and it's like you have I was made for loving you, and probably Dirty Living, and the rest really is not disco at all. All right. the Ace songs on that are really good. So I mean, it's yeah. it's a decent album. Yeah, I think so. I always liked it. Ryan. Oh, I said I wasn't going to talk about this album, but I lied. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, uh, now, this is this is kind of due to my age a little bit, just because I'm 41 now. So when I was getting into the band, like this was a new, newer album at the time. Uh, but you know what? I like it. I, I've gone back to it over the years, kind of expecting to dislike it, but it's never like worn off for me. And that is uh, Die Balls and Musica by Slayer. Uh, I could tell you, it's become popular uh, to kind of trash Kerry King because, you know, he, over years, he kind of ends up looking like a little bit of a clown with the freaking tattoos. And the, he's got these welders glasses on and, you know, the, you know, he's got like a dead raccoon strapped to his chin. But uh, this album, it's a if you look at the credits, this is mostly a Jeff Hanneman album. Uh, Kerry King obviously helped co-write some songs, some of the lyrics, but Hanneman is largely responsible for this. So if you're going to trash this album, you know, you got to really kind of trash Jeff. Cause this is almost kind of his baby, but I don't know. It's, it's, 
a lot of like I fucking hate risk, to be honest with you. Uh most of the big four bands around by the like, end of the nineties, you know, you could, the early nineties was a little different. Some of them were still putting along, but by the end of the nineties, uh, I don't think any of them were really doing anything I liked. But this is a heavy album. I mean, it's perversions of pain, uh, bitter peace, point, scrum. Uh the only song on it which kind of has that like shitty nineties feel to me that I can't get into is the third one, Stain of Mind. But you know, again, that's just one song to skip. But otherwise, the production's nasty. It is tuned a little lower, but the guitar tone is just like this dirty, filthy sound. So it doesn't have like uh I know it's been called like you know, old Slayer went new metal, but it's ninety eight, so that stuff was still kind of new. And you know, they wrote it in the years preceding that. So like unless which to me would mean I almost kind of invented new metal. Now I could hear the next album, God Hates Us All. Yeah, it does kind of have more of that new metal-y slipknot kind of thing going on. Uh, still not a bad album, but to me, this is way better. Uh, is it one of the best Slayer albums? Fuck no. Is it Rain and Blood? Fuck no. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, I think it's still a pretty damn good album. I throw it on every now and then, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? I want to play the whole thing all the way through. Maybe that one song I'll skip, but otherwise, not bad. And uh, next one's a double shot. Uh, is another thrash band, this one from Canada. Uh, so these guys did a whole slew of classic albums in the 80s. A very iconic vocalist, uh, Sheepdog was his uh, nickname. Band was Razor. Uh, they did their best album, 1988, Violent Restitution, which is just a balls out, like mosh pit starting, like nuclear thrash album, just pure energy, pure intensity. And then they lose him and get uh, this guy, Bob Reed, who I don't mind. And uh, they kind of changed their sound a little bit. It was a little more of like a tough guy, kind of like, uh, uh, I'm not going to say like a tough guy hardcore thing, but they kind of lost some of the fun in the sound. And they became a little more serious, try, trying to be serious. They did two albums, but you know what? I still like them. And one was Shotgun Justice, which has some awesome artwork. Uh, not a band that was ever known for great art. And then one was called Open Hostility. And then they kind of fucked off for a couple of years. Uh, this one actually was recorded with a drum machine because the drummer at the time had some uh, problems going on. So the main guy, Dave Carlo, the guitarist, is like, fuck it, I'll just program a drum machine. And uh, it's noticeable. Uh, it's obviously not an organic drummer, but it doesn't really ruin the album. It's not great, but the song, I mean, to me, these albums are it's great weightlifting metal. It's just great angry. It's just It doesn't require a lot of brain cells. Uh, not that Razor ever did. But uh, these albums really don't. But it's fine. You know, I'm not looking for like this. I'm not looking for Mozart when I put on thrash metal. You know, you know, if it's something to pick up, you know, flip tables over and run through walls, you know, checks that box. I'm happy with it. So, yeah, these albums always got kind of a lot of shit. I know a lot of guys that love their 80s stuff. And as soon as like Sheepdog left and like Bob came in, they're like, nope, fuck these two albums. Don't want to. Absolutely not. You know, not in my collection. And uh, I do agree the 80s stuff is better. But I don't know. I like these two albums a lot. Uh Never had an issue with them. So that is my only honorable mentions. Cool. You know, Ryan just reminded me how old I'm getting because he just said he's 41. And I'm like, I've known him since he was barely legal to drink. And I'm shit. I'm thinking, holy fuck. I thought you'd be in your 30s forever. And I'm like, well, 10 years like everybody else. <laughs> Oof. Yeah, because you've known me since like uh, yeah, early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, so you you were literally I've known you since you were either just legal to drink or right before, right around there. Yeah, so you're about twenty years now. I have yeah. this thing where I I have this like amnesia where I don't remember where I met people. Like I'm like, oh, this person's in my life now. Like you could put a fucking gun to my head and be like, where did you meet Chris Allo? And I'd be like, well, just fucking shoot me. So I have no idea. Like I don't remember the circumstances. Like I just like I just know people, you know. And it's like with ninety five percent of the people I know, I just have that happen. So yeah. It's like if someone if someone would like before today, before right now, would have walked up to me and say, Oh, you know Ryan for a long time. How old is Ryan? I'm like, ah, he's probably like 34, 35 or something like that. Oh, thanks. You know, it's, it's my just, the years just it's my uh skincare my, routine, you know. Yeah. Youthful See, complexion. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. glowing skin. It's my glow, thank you. My glowing skin, you know, it radiate. Uh nope, 41 this year. No. All right. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, you know me I got a thing. I got a buddy like that too. I met him when he was like 23, and now he's like 44. I'm like, what? Yeah, where did years ago, right? It's like, how was that? You're possible? an old man too. How did you get here? <laughs> yeah. It's like, aren't you still like 28? And it's like, nah, man, I've known you for like 25 years. Like, what? Yeah, I know a couple of people like that too, or I've known them since they were teenagers. Now they're about my age, but I'm like, man, I've known you more than half my life. Like, yeah. Anyways, it's right? It's crazy. Uh, Ralph, got any left? Yep. Uh, I just got to say though, uh, the two biggest disappointments in my life with album releases 
was Turbo and Cold Lake, and they were both picked as albums that these fuckers like, which is crazy. But we, I have to show my my Cold Lake because uh, I, I think I might have even shown this before. But uh, Tom Warrior, when he I pulled this out, I had a, a stack of albums for him to sign, and when he got to the bottom, he looked at this and he looked at me like all pissed off, and then he wrote this on there. He wrote Abomination, and then he still signed it, but he he just. Um, then uh, Martin Ain just put a question mark on it, like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, why are you giving me this to sign? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the album that Chris likes. There's that know. fucking photo. Oh, yep. There you the go. Hey, listen, there, when I got that advanced <laughs> tape, there was there was no picture. <laughs> Zip your fucking pants up. Come on now. <laughs> and then kids might kids might be watching. Tur Turbo too. I mean, it, it, it's weird because when I look back, like um, how many bands disappointed me right all around that same time. Like a lot of the traditional metal bands, it really opened the door for me to get into the more underground stuff because I was like, yeah, fuck all these bands that are selling out. But uh, so this is a band, uh, Sam Ale, uh, Nick's a big fan of them. Uh, this album, Passage, uh, a lot of people, you know, they, these this was a great black metal band that had like the raw heavy black metal and they were great with what they were doing. But when they put this album out, this was like, such a difference uh that people some people just hated it because it was kind of like industrialish they had keyboards heavy on the keyboards and stuff but i thought they they came out with something super original and i thought it was a breath of fresh air i really love this album and um it, it's weird how some people like at this point that was it they only liked the early stuff and they kind of went along this path for years to come and they're still on this path but uh this was like the beginning of it i love this album and I grabbed a couple that I just thought of as we were doing this, but uh, one was uh, the Misfits, uh, with, uh, the Michael Graves era. People hated this. You know, if you're a huge Danzig fan, and um, I, I was a big Danzig fan. Misfits are my favorite punk band, but I, I ended up really liking these albums. They, they're more metal sounding. They're definitely cleaned up sounding, but they still singing about horror movies, which is what I love about them. And um <laughs> So yeah, I, I like those albums, where even though a lot of people hate it. Um, and then this other one I just grabbed, but this is one that really people just seem to really hate. But um, I, I, as soon as it came out, with an album cover like that, you know people are going to hate it. This has got to be one of the worst album covers of all time. This Black Flag album. Or best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I know, I love their old stuff. Their original artwork by Petty Bond. I mean, that's yeah. probably, I think that's him too, but right? No, no, no. He had nothing to do with this. Oh, right, that's right. Yeah. Greg Ginn, their old covers were cool. Yeah. Um, he had a big falling out with him, Greg Ginn. But, uh, you know, they got the second singer back for this album. And I, I thought it was good. I I mean, it wasn't super memorable, real classic <laughs> album, but it, it was, I thought it was good. I bought it right away. And I seen them with this lineup and I thought they were great. But, man, people just fucking shit all over this album. And I think it's all right. That's it. All right, I got a few here. Um, Dream Theater falling into infinity. A lot of people crapped all over this. The label wanted them to write more accessible, hooky songs. And some of it is, but some of it is typical Dream Theater. I really dig it a lot. Uh, Rolling Stones undercover. People a great album. Come song. on. I, I like that one. Right. I think it's great, right? It, it's so Undercover of the Night's a great song. It's amazing. Song. It's amazing. Uh, some people shit on this album because uh, and I and a really popular guy left the band. Uh, Dream Evil by Dio. You know, I was thinking of that one, but I think it's well liked, isn't it? I think it's, yeah, it's that's my second talking. favorite Dio album after Holy Diver. I love that album. I was say, don't ask Butch if anybody likes that album. He'll tell oh, you. Oh, it. oh, Campbell. Uh, I think Goldie's great on it, and the first Night People. I think it's one of the best songs they ever wrote. I think it's more pop better than there. Sacred Heart. Yeah, yeah, it's better than Sacred Heart. I, I, better I think Sacred it's better Heart. than Sacred Heart. Yeah exactly uh what else what else uh I, chris i had to bring this one up because at the time i think everybody hated it uh seven star by black sabbath yeah i i almost used that one yeah i i wasn't gonna pick i figured i'd leave it for honorable mentions because everybody complains we talk about sabbath too much but i don't care um i think it's a really good album whether it should be called sabbath or not i don't know but i think it's a great album regardless of what it Agreed. is um, and on that same note I think thirteen is really good too, and a lot of people shit on that album yep. now. Uh, I, like I think it. I think it's a really fun album uh, as a way to go out. I think it's really good, 
And uh, my last pick for today is uh, UFO Misdemeanor. This was kind of like their hair metal band. So basically, Phil Mogg put UFO back together after they were broken up for a couple of years. And uh, it's just him and a bunch of other guys with big hair. And it kind of doesn't really sound like UFO, but I think it's pretty damn good for what it is. Uh, it's just a good 80s accessible hard rock album with lots of keyboards and some good guitar playing. And I kind of dig it. Terrible album cover, by the way, but whatever. So. I I, uh, I think I talked about it. I hated 30 when it came out. I hated I hated what Rick Rubin did on the production. I hated that they fucked Bill Ward over. Uh, I hated Sharon Osbourne for all the usual reasons. But I've warmed to that album a lot, actually. Yeah. Uh, last time I listened it. to it, I liked it. Yeah, yeah, it's really warmed up to yeah. me. I'm just like, you know what? It's the last Sabbath album. You take it for what it is. and I got it right there on the wall. It's solid. It's, uh, it's not one of my favorites, but I, I hated it when it came out. I'm like, fuck this. This is shit. And some you know, of those uh, bonus, some of those bonus songs are really good, like Methodemic yeah, and uh, Na- Naivete and Black. You know, those are those are really good songs. The other was that God is Dead EP. might be one of the weaker tracks. And that's was, good. Um, you mean the bonus because there was another EP of the four actually like the tours the tour EP. You talking about those tracks? There, well, the the version I have is the like uh, it's the the Best Buy version that had like the four lots, right? extra, right. four extra yeah. songs bonus disc on, on the on yeah okay, that one. The and then there was the tour the, the tour release that, that we got then there was yeah, another yeah, right, had four right. which was good too yeah. those yeah. like those I don't know I've really warmed up to that over the years I'm like yeah, essentially they rec- there you go the end yeah essentially they recorded a double album and they it gave right. it to you piecemeal yeah yeah. I, I think it's good. I, you know, it's kind of like cliche Sabbath, right? But I still think it's good. It's Sabbath, you know. Well, yeah, cliche I'll, Sabbath. Is still take like it over, never like, say die. I yeah. I hear you, my friend. I hear you. I'm, I'm on when the thirteen side. was new. It sounded like Sabbath trying to be Sabbath a little too much. But as the years go on, that kind of wears off that feeling, and it just it's just Sabbath. It's just Sabbath. Yeah, I feel the yeah. same way. I'm like, it's just Sabbath. It's yeah. Cool. Well, uh, for everybody watching, uh, let us know what some albums most people don't like that you really dig quite a bit. Put those down in the comments below. I'm sure we'll have some stuff that uh, we haven't covered today, but I think we had a good selection of material here today. So we like these albums. Hey, but not everybody does. And that's okay. Right. That's okay. So thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, Visit us on the web at www.seeatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together. All the, all, the time. Time. all the damn time. All the damn time. And I want to thank Jamie for jumping on at the Woo-hoo. 11th hour, literally 11th hour. I'm like, shit, I'm taping proxy. Yeah. Like, shit, Running around the house, getting the dogs. Hey, picking a cool metal t-shirt. Took 10 Watching minutes. Watching Chucky movies. Watching Chucky movies, yeah. You got to go back and finish Tomb of the Blind. That's one of the best. I will. I'll, I'll finish awesome. it tomorrow. I'll finish it. And, and the end's great, two, too. Two, three, and four. Yeah. They're yeah. cool with the first one. Sacrifice <laughs> scene with the sucking on the bloody boobies. Woo, wow. Oh, 10 out of 10. Is this rated PG? 10 out of 10. <laughs> Did you get the uh, the Synapse uh, uh, set that came out? Like, which, what are you watching it on? Oh, I just streamed it, but I but I was Googling, looking at the sets. It's a, it's a nice... Chris, did you get yours? No, uh, I'm waiting. Someone's going to do a 4K. I know it, so... All right. Well, is it Blu-ray? Because I can only find a DVD. Yeah, there is a there is a Blu-ray. Yeah. Is there uh, of right. just the first one, and there's also a Blu-ray of just Third. the fourth one. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because I can only find different DVD companies. You got Shout Factory, and then yeah. I think Synapse. But Synapse. there's one in a coffin shape, and it's all DVDs. That's DVDs. Yeah, I had that. I sold it. Yeah. It's... I had. I also sold mine. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good series, really good series. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we digress. Here we are. Yeah. We're, we're, we started Let's talk about that on Thursday. <laughs> exactly. We'll rank them. Yeah, we'll rank them. Yes, exactly. So, uh, speaking of Chucky, that's coming up on the monster, not this week, but in two weeks. I guess that cool, uh, I haven't put it on anything yet, but this cool, oh, nice. the blind dead pin. Oh, it's, okay. It's, it's pretty fucking big, so I don't want it to fall off whatever vest I put it on, but yeah. It, that was given to me as a gift, and it's really fucking cool. Because they had the, uh, the Templars in that movie, like the bad guys. Amazing. Yeah. They yeah, are so great. Cool. They are great. Yeah, they don't make a sound, right? They just, yeah. Not just, a single sound. So, no, they don't need to either. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody, for uh, Count Ralphus and Ryan and Chris and Craig and Jamie. I'm Pete. For everybody else who didn't make it tonight, we'll see you all next time here on the Hudson Valley Squares in two weeks. Till then, have a good one, everybody. Take care.